Uh, this video is in order to look primarily at something that occurs in Shakespeare's work, Hamlet, namely the um, disgust with the world and the ecclesiastical, um, what would you call, negativity that Hamlet has. Why does he have that? I hold that Hamlet is a critique of the nominalist position, among other things. It is a critique of the nominalist position from the scholastic debate of the 13th century. I want to dedicate this video primarily to my own children um, to explain to them things that I can't easily explain or have not yet been able to easily explain, to show them something of what has been lost and what therefore can be regained. You know, as Colonel Brandon says, there's nothing lost that can't be regained if sought for. I'm going to be talking in this video then about two major things, hopefully, <laughs> God willing. One, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about sacred geometry, what sacred geometry is. And second, I want to talk about the scholastic collapse, the, the, the problem that occurred in the 13th century and what it entailed, what it actually meant for the Western world, for Christianity and for the Western world. If those two topics interest you, then stay put. I'm going to be going through a couple different things, um, and I want to be as clear as possible. <clears throat> but I'm pulling together a number of different strands here, so just bear with me. Let's take the first thing first, which is the, um, the, 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 the sacred geometry idea. Why do I say that? Well, uh, when we look at the scholastic problem, most sources will talk about the scholastic problem as being a, um, a collapse of the old order. That's what Romano Guardini says. It's a collapse of the old order and the beginning of the modern world. So Romano Guardini in the end of the modern world says that in the 13th century, the, um, the medieval world, the Western world collapsed and the modern world began replacing a sort of piety and seeking for truth with um, a seeking after material goods and power. In his great book about the scholastics called Scholasticism, Joseph Pieper suggests that the scholastic thing was a union between uh, faith and reason. <clears throat> It was an explosive union that together faith and reason were capable of producing tremendous things. <clears throat> but faith and reason uh, look in two different directions. Reason, you can say, looks towards the things of the earth and faith looks towards the things of the heavens. Much like Plato used to suggest the philosopher king is a, a, a paradox because the philosopher looks to the things of the heavens and the king looks to the things of the earth. Well, in order to understand what they're actually doing in that great project of the scholastic uh, accumulation of goods, of ideas, we have to understand that they were talking in one of the most pure forms about mathematics. The whole scholastic debate was a debate about the nature of mathematics. They put it into another, another term, another language, but at its heart, it wasn't about mathematics. Caveat, I am not a mathematician. I, had, I failed a mathematics class in college and had to retake it. I was never really excelling in mathematics. Never saw the point of mathematics until my early 20s. Given that, after I really did see the point in my early 20s. I began reading about a different form of mathematics, different from the common way of teaching mathematics. And this is what was called esoteric mathematics, or sacred geometry. What do we mean by esoteric mathematics? Esoteric mathematics is mathematics that's hidden. It's esoteric, it's hidden. It is a way of looking at mathematics that's different than building bridges or counting chickens or um, uh, 
making sure all your troops are in the right place. Esoteric mathematics has a basic assumption that math is a language for a divine existence, a divine power of some kind, a divine presence. And I like to explain it to my students normally by saying that you can look at mathematics as either quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative mathematics is counting eggs. It's counting bridges. It's making sure that your troops are all in the right place. Now my button's on done. Pardon me, Mr. Partner. Qualitative mathematics, on the other hand, suggests that there are qualities that the numbers represent. And these powerful qualities can be understood through mathematical um, workings, the mathematical understanding, through manipulation of the mathematics. And yes, it does devolve sometimes into forms of magic. Magic actually derives from this. It's like a, a bastardization of this high practice. But this, this high practice was the, the high practice of almost every major thinker from, from uh, uh, Johannes Kepler to um, even Thomas Aquinas to um, to the, the, the Archimedes, for instance, uh, Plato himself. The, all the great thinkers were involved somehow in this idea about mathematics and talking about it. So let me draw out some, some guns here just to clarify what I'm talking about here. I want to start with um, John Mitchell. This is my small stack. John Mitchell, this is a view over Atlantis, I think this is the one that I want to talk about. Yes. Um, actually, he has two books here, City of Revelation and The View Over Atlantis. This is from City of Revelation that I want to look at first, this quotation from City of Revelation. He talks about this idea, and there's a lot of stuff that is associated with this, so just sorry to give this caveat, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that's associated with this that sounds weird, sounds strange, sounds odd. If it does sound weird and strange, look at our own era, which is very weird and very strange. The people of the medieval era and the people of the ancient world and the people for thousands of years before them thought this way, that numbers represented something. They were qualitative. And they distinguish in some ways between qualitative and quantitative numbers. But uh, Mitchell makes this point in the City of Revelation. He says, um, as quoting Carl Jung, as we know from ancient Egyptian history, there are symptoms of psychic changes that always appear at the end of one platonic month and at the beginning of another. The analogy with human nature does not, however, says Mitchell, support the mechanical theory, for as the philosopher, magicians of antiquity were aware, intelligence is made up of the same creative influences that reign throughout the universe. So it is impossible to attribute an exclusively external or internal origin to portentous phenomena such as are now seen in the skies. The magical belief was that, although the power of the gods is irresistible, individually they are inferior to men. And if he becomes conscious of the position and achieves dominion over his mind, a man can become in himself the temple of the gods and dispose of their influence to his own advantage instead of being forever at the mercy of unrecognized forces. Man, temple, and cosmos were therefore seen to be identical. And on this understanding, the entire philosophy and science of the ancient world was founded. Now, when he talks about gods, he means the ancient gods, you know, the Egyptian, the Greek, the Roman gods. Those gods represented certain powers, which the Christian church talks about as angelic powers, either fallen angels, demons, or the angels that serve God. They are translated into Christianity as those things. So Mitchell suggests, okay? And Mitchell says that mathematics was a way of being able to understand the structure of the universe so that man could become a temple of the good powers, 
and avoid the bad powers. Good angels, bad angels, whatever. And what that meant was that architecture, churches, were a conduit for translating man's spirit into its better angels. That was the idea. But for ancient people, mathematics was something which united mankind to the universe itself. And he goes on to say in a further part of this chapter, he says, um, although it is known as the hermetic or secret tradition, it's another name for esoteric mathematics, hermetic tradition, its material content has never been hidden from anyone who felt inclined to study it. There are no esoteric schemes of geometry, no secret laws of mathematics, lost chords, or musical harmonies which may not be discovered by searching. A profound scholarship in the various individual arts and sciences is open to whoever cares to achieve it without the necessity for any mystical initiation. The sum of all that has ever been discovered about the physical nature of the universe may be acquired through application and the use of reason. So Mitchell is pointing out that this system, which I'm, I'm going to describe here, is available to everybody. And it is available, really. If you want to find out more about this, read John Mitchell's City of Revelation. Or read Robert Lawler, whom I will talk about in just a minute. Or go to a website, type in Sacred Geometry, find out more about it. If you don't want to find out about it, that's fine too. But if... You want to find out what the medievals were doing and what happened in the scholastic problem, the scholastic collapse. You have to understand this system. And I posit that if you really want to understand Hamlet, you have to understand what happened in the collapse of the scholastic system, because that's what Hamlet is about. Okay, all right. So, there it is. Uh, Mitchell also says in another book, and this is The View Over Atlantis by John Mitchell, he talks about how numbers were qualitative. Each number represented an idea or a principle. And when we have literature, literary forms, the literature was another language to talk about the same thing, but it was based upon the numerical forms. So. The question is not, for instance, in Genesis, how, how did God create everything out of nothing? Or um, how is it that Adam and Eve uh, fell out of the garden and went down to a city of men? You know, or um, how did God rip the, the rib out of Adam and create Eve? Or, or even, is this real or not? You know, that, that's not the question. The question is to ask is why six? for the number of days. Why six? Because God rests on the seventh day. Why six? Why the number six? That's the question to ask. Because the numbers represent the idea that's trying to be gotten across. Mitchell says here, even the structures of the literary languages were built upon numbers. It is well known that the letters of the Greek and Hebrew alphabets have their numerical values, and it is a well-established tradition, the truth of which inquiry will confirm that in certain books of the Bible, whole passages, as well as words and phrases, are constructed according to a system of geometry and mathematics, which enables those instructed in the art to obtain an insight into their more profound meaning. The sacred works the sacred words can be interpreted through their numbers, the sum of the numerical values of their component letters, and the principles discovered to which they relate, for every number has its place in a language formed according to the cosmic pattern. The philosophers of the ancient world discovered that the peculiar qualities of these numbers could be discerned through measurement of the visible universe. Astronomers found them in the cosmic ratios, in the relative sizes of the heavenly bodies, and in the intervals that separated them. Mathematicians proved their relevance to the figure of regular geometry and discovered the magic squares and numerological patterns by which their geometrical relationships were further revealed. Musicians and artists observed that these same numbers and ratios were those 
that produced the most perfect harmonies and touched the deepest sources of human emotion. They contained, in fact, the secrets of magic. Now he calls it magic. You know, the word magic basically means uh, knowledge from magus. Our current understanding of magic is that it's, you know, it's demonology, it's witchcraft. It, um, demonology and witchcraft are a bastardized form of this. Magic originally meant knowledge of this system, you know, being able to manipulate these numbers. That's what it meant. So when we talk about whether or not this is compatible with Christianity, in the modern era, we may have problems with it. In the medieval era, there was no problem with it. They knew exactly what was meant by magic, and they knew exactly who the people were who had this superior knowledge. And they were considered Christians, just like any other Christian. Um, even the people that didn't understand it knew there was something there because they saw the cathedrals or they heard the music that was in harmony. One more thing from Mitchell. From the sacred numbers were formed words and phrases representing to the initiates certain natural principles whose meaning can only be divined by allusion and by educated intuition. Myths and poems were constructed on numerical principles, using those formulae which could be shown through measurement to express the physical structure of the universe, which had been found to have a corresponding magical truth in their effect on the human soul. Dynasties and religions were built in the same way, the inhabitants of court and pantheon being allotted names whose numbers reveal the principle for which they stand. Okay. So his point is that the magic, as he calls it, was everywhere. It was in music, it was in art, it was in architecture, it was in philosophy, it was in literature, it was in song and dance, it was even in dynasties and religions and the names of rulers. It was a connection to a mathematical system because the mathematics represented a certain power, a certain uh, existence beyond our world. And that representation could be comprehended by the human mind and it constituted a whole system. Everything was connected. Man was connected to the universe and the cycles of time, which made sense because they were based upon a logical structure. And man could understand God and the mind of God and his place in the universe because of this system. So things were in their, their place, everything fit, right? Here's another uh, bit to add to this. This is um, Merce Eliade. Merce Eliade and his Sacred and Profane, The Nature of Religion. A very good read, I highly recommend it. He says, in the perenniality of celestial symbols. We must note that even when the celestial gods no longer dominate religious life, the sidereal regions, Uranian symbolism, myths and rites of ascent and the like, retain a preponderant place in the economy of the sacred. In other words, these gods don't ever really die. You know, these powers, they don't ever really die. What is above? high, continues to reveal the transcendent in every religious complex. Driven from the cult and replaced in mythologies by other themes, in the religious, religious life the sky remains ever-present by virtue of its symbolism. And this celestial symbolism in turn infuses and supports a number of rites of ascent, climbing, initiation, royalty, and so on, of myths like the cosmic tree, the cosmic mountain, the chain of arrows connecting earth with heaven, and so on, of legends like magical flight, the symbolism of the center of the world, whose immense dissemination we have seen, likewise illustrates the importance of celestial symbolism. For it is at a center that communication with the sky is affected, and the sky constitutes the paradigmatic image of transcendence. It could be said that the very structure of the cosmos keeps memory of the celestial supreme being alive. It is as if the gods had created the world in such a way that it could not but reflect their existence. But no world is possible without verticality, and that dimension alone is enough to evoke transcendence. Driven from religious life in the strict sense, the celestial sacred remains active through symbolism. A religious symbol conveys its message even if it is no longer consciously understood in every part. 
for a symbol speaks to the whole human being, not only to the intelligence. Okay, so Mercia or Mercia Eliade is suggesting that the very structure of the universe lends itself to symbolism and our understanding of ourselves in that symbolism. That symbolism is expressed most purely in that mathematical structure. And it is something which is designed in order to tr to help us transcend our lower selves, our bestial selves, our the, the pull of the demonic, and to convert to the higher powers, as Mitchell suggests. This system of mathematics was designed to do that. Uh, people like Johannes Kepler, for instance, suggested that it was in the very structure of the planets. You know, this is the harmony derelict, the harmonies of the world. And Kepler <laughs> suggests here, he says, um, accordingly from the Mysterium Cosmographicum, let me here briefly inculcate the order of the five solids in the world, whereof three are primary and two are secondary because Kepler suggested, as did the Platonists, that there were five major solids in the mathematical system. There are, as it were, two noteworthy weddings of these figures made from different classes. The males, the cube and the dodecahedron, among the primary. The females, the octahedron and the isosahedron among the secondary to which is added one, as it were, bachelor or hermaphrodite, the tetrahedron, because it is inscribed in itself, just as those female solids are inscribed in the males and are, as it were, subject to them, out of the signs of the feminine sex opposite the masculine, namely angles opposite planes. Okay, so he goes on about that. So Kepler himself, Johannes Kepler, was talking about how mathematics is related to this world of solids and geometrical images, and that all of it was related to the actual planets and stars that we see. So the whole cosmos was itself based on a mathematical principle. The mathematical principle came down to two major powers, a masculine and a feminine power. Now, I don't want to beat this into the ground too much, but there's a really interesting read called The Languages of the Angels. And this is by Renzo Manetti. It's a study of the Basilica of San Miniato in Florence, the symbols and secrets therein, and it has this really interesting little point. Okay. He says on page 51 in my text, squaring was a geometrical and mathematical problem of immense symbolic significance because in sacred geometry, the square stands for the earth while the circle is the image of the sky or heaven. This led the ancients to believe that the formula for squaring the circle would give them the key to joining heaven to earth, the macrocosm to the microcosm, like some kind of enormously powerful talisman. Let me read that again. Squaring was a geometrical and mathematical problem of immense symbolic significance. In sacred geometry, the square stands for the earth, the circle, the image of the sky or heaven. This led the ancients to believe that the formula for squaring the circle would give them the key to joining heaven to earth, the macrocosm to the microcosm, like some kind of enormously powerful talisman. How many older churches have you seen that are based upon the square or the doubling of the square, which is the rectangle? How many of those ancient churches, especially in the, the Renaissance, have a circular dome on top of them? This is not accidental, see, because these architects were talking about the squaring of the circle as a powerful entity in itself. It was a joining of the masculine and feminine powers yeah, based upon this esoteric mathematical thought. And that therefore the church, which was the converting device for the human soul from its lower angels to its higher angels, the church represented a union between heaven and earth, which was reflected in the whole structure of the universe. Masculine and feminine power. Feminine is the square. Masculine is the circular. Heaven was the circular. Earth was the square, like the four points of the compass. 
So in this, in this structure called esoteric mathematics, or sacred geometry, what they were doing was they were looking at mathematics as a way of understanding the powers beyond this world. Uh, Robert Lawler says this, he says, many ancient cultures chose to examine reality through the metaphors of geometry and music, music being the study of the proportional laws of sound frequency. So Lawler suggests that our current physical world is itself the result of frequencies, and that those frequencies were mathematically uh, shaped, mathematically decided. It's like crystallization of matter which in modern physics is interesting because modern physicists actually talk about how matter is the cooled down energy, plasma cooled down. And I'm not a physicist, but, but nevertheless, when they talk about it, they talk about energy cooled down as matter, E equals MC squared, right? That's the, the scientific formula from Mr. Einstein. That in and of itself was an observation that the world is based upon a mathematical structure. And he goes on to say, the following here. Let's see if I can find this. Um, he says, geometry is the study of spatial order through the measure and relationships of forms. Geometry and arithmetic together with astronomy, the science of temporal order through the observation of cyclic movement, constituted the major intellectual disciplines of classical education. The fourth element of this great fourfold syllabus, the quadrivium, was a study of harmonic, harmony or harmonics and music. The laws of simple harmonies were considered to be universals, which defined the relationship and interchange between the temporal movements and events of the heavens and the spatial order and development on earth. The implicit goal, says Lawler, of this education was to enable the mind to become a channel through which the earth, the level of manifested form, could receive the abstract cosmic life of the heavens. The practice of geometry was an approach to the way in which the universe is ordered and sustained. Geometric diagrams can be contemplated as still moments revealing a continuous, timeless, universal action generally hidden from our sensory perception. Thus, a seemingly common mathematical activity can become a discipline for intellectual and spiritual insight. That's a really choice line along with uh, Manati's point. Geometric diagrams can be contemplated as still moments, revealing a continuous, timeless, universal action, generally hidden from our sensory perception. It's as though when you looked at the physical objects around us, they are mathematical formulas frozen in time, cooled down, if you will. And when we look at a geometric form, we are looking at the, the, the geometric basis for the physical world around us, but paused, like, like as though we could take out a single slide and look at it for just a minute and put it back in again, because it's gonna shift and, and change like a kaleidoscope does, you know. Mathematics, therefore, represented this ability for humans to see beyond the physical veil of the world and to see the essence of the heart of what actually is behind this world, the eternal thing rather than the temporal thing that we live in now. And by studying mathematics, especially geometry, we could then perceive not just the pattern itself, but the patterner, the one who made the pattern. So think of it this way. We think about one, two, three, four, five as like one chicken, two chicken, three chicken, four chicken, five chickens. They thought of it as one is unity, it represents unity. Two represents otherness, contemplation and otherness. Three represents community, the communal nature of, of the of two beings, so much so that it that it is in and of itself a thing. Four represents the earth and the four patterns of the earth, you know, the northwest, east, south. Five represented mankind himself, that is human beings. Six, then, represent 
the divine interchange, the interchange between heaven and earth. And seven constituted uh, the, 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 the holy number, the lucky number, the, the number of generation. So whenever we saw numbers in the Bible, for instance, or in other works that, that had these numbers, they were, they were hearkening back to those basic forms. And when, for instance, we had uh, letters or words that added up to a certain number, that number was what was important, not the name itself, but the number. That's called gematria in the ancient world. The Jews practiced this, the Greeks practiced this, the Egyptians, the Romans, um, even, the, even as far east as the Chinese and, and the, uh, the Muslims all practiced this idea of mathematics as a entity in and of itself. And it was a, primarily in Plato, in the West, it was a, a power or a thing that had come down to us from very, very old, as, probably as old as the Neolithic or before era. You know, Stone Age people seem to have thought this way and worked about, about these ideas. In this system, the most, um, the most powerful thing was the number five, which was the attempt to square the masculine and feminine, the heavens and the earth the circle and the square, to put them together. That's where we get the number five, is if basically from trying to put those things together, heaven and earth, square and circle, and to make them the same area, essentially. That's squaring the circle. This system of thought came down to the medieval era and took the form in the scholastic world of the attempt to unify faith and reason, as Joseph Pieper said. And essentially, all those men who collected the materials from the ancient world were trying to revive a, a technique of thought that had been lost. Not just thought in terms of words, but thought in terms of numbers. Well, <laughs> what then did that lead to? That led to this crisis that occurred in the late 13th century. And before we get to that crisis, um, I encourage you again to read, if you can, on this mathematics, this esoteric mathematics. Look it up online, Sacred Geometry. Find out a little bit about it. Understanding it gives you an insight, the insight, into what actually occurred at the end of the 13th century and why it was so significant and why we are still dealing with it today.